My name is Dale Latticer. I'm a local musician, writer, producer, and blatherskite, and general rabble rouser. And uh, I've been asked to facilitate this very, very important conference on the fault lines of poverty. We have two wonderful, wonderful speakers um, who will be speaking for 20 minutes each, and then we're going to open it up to comments and questions. Um, Please speak loudly. If you wish, uh, you can come down to the floor so that you're picked up by the microphone a little better. Um, I'd like to introduce both of the uh, wonderful speakers, speakers to you. This is Jordan Hamilton, and uh, he is, uh, has worked for the United Nations and the World Bank. He is currently employed by the Calgary Drop-In and Rehab Center, Canada's largest homeless shelter. He has been awarded a master's degree in economics, an MBA, and the Queen Elizabeth II Golden Jubilee Medal for making a significant contribution to Canada. Yes. Whenever I'm, I'm spewing witticisms, I should always say I should work for the UN, but, but this man actually has worked for the UN, so that's quite lovely. Um, this is John Kochman. And uh, uh, John is the research coordinator for the Edmonton Social Planning Council, uh, a nonprofit social research organization focusing on solutions to poverty and low income challenges. They have done excellent, excellent work over the years. Since joining the council in 2006, John has researched and written on social policy issues, including poverty, wealth and income inequality, removing employment barriers for those with low and modest incomes, social determinants of health, affordable housing, and neighborhood revitalization. So John Kochman will be speaking first. Please give it up for John Kochman. Uh, thanks a lot, Dale. And uh, can everyone hear me? I'm, usually I have no trouble having my voice carry. Um, I guess we engaged in a little bit of creative disruption here this morning uh, by switching meeting rooms and uh, not to be outdone, uh, Jordan and I also uh, decided to uh, switch uh, speaking orders, partly because I'm going to give a little bit more of a broader overview of uh, poverty and inequality in this province. And uh, um, just uh, we'll see how this works. Okay. So for, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about poverty, and I specifically want to focus on uh, children and youth living in poverty. Uh, and, and I've got a slide here that actually is uh, from a presentation that's being released next week uh, that we're doing jointly with uh, uh, the Public Interest Alberta and the Alberta College of Social Workers. And it, it's always shocking to me, uh, you know, how high poverty rates really are, not, not only in this country, you know, but, but in this province. And, and the fact that we, we've, we've had very little success in, in meaningfully reducing uh, those rates. Uh, again, this compares 1989 to 2012. And as you can see, uh, child and youth poverty has actually gone up in Canada. And, and even in Alberta, where, where during most of this period we've had a very strong economy, particularly in the 2000s, uh, you know, we've, we've barely managed to uh, put a dent in poverty and there's been, been very little change. So that's one. Um, also want to uh, take a look at, at what's happened in, uh, since the year 2000 in terms of poverty rates. Again, the blue is Canada, the red is Alberta. And uh, as you can see, since 2000, there, there's been a bit of improvement. Uh, so we went into a situation where, where poverty increased quite steadily throughout the 1990s. And, and since then, it has, has dropped off some. But, but even in Alberta, you know, we're, we're still looking at, at poverty rates of, of over 16%. So that's almost one in six children and youth living in poverty in this province. Uh, the other thing that I don't have time to get into, but I'll just mention, is that you know, the, the younger you are, the more likely you are to live in, in poverty. So, so child and youth poverty rates tend to be consistently higher than, than poverty rates uh, of the overall population. Next slide. Poverty is sometimes seen as, as being only a big city phenomenon. Uh, Calgary and Edmonton, but, but this slide certainly shows, this is for the year 2012, the prevalence of children and youth living in low-income families, and, and again, this is anyone that's under the age of 18, so it does include both children and youth. And as you can see that, uh, you know, uh, 
we have poverty throughout Alberta, and we, we just looked at the, the seven largest urban centers, and, and the highest poverty rate is actually not even in Edmonton or Calgary, but rather in Lethbridge uh, at 19.1%. Uh, and Red Deer, which, which has uh, been considered to have a very bo booming economy, has the, the second highest uh, poverty rate at 16.7%. And, uh, and then you, we also have uh, figures for the, uh, the, uh, the other uh, regional centers. So I guess the takeaway here again is that we have poverty throughout the province. Uh, it's not just a, a big city phenomenon. Um, this is a, 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 an interesting slide, uh, and uh, you know, there's a lot of myths about poverty, and, and one of them is that people who live in poverty, you know, I mean, they're they're kind of not, you know, they they find it more comfortable live on income support. Uh, I can I can guarantee you that. Uh, and I probably don't have to convince you that that is not the case, uh, particularly if you look at uh, what income support rates are. And what, what this uh, chart shows is for the year 2012, you know, the, the, uh, the split between uh, three different main types of income, uh, both for lone parent families on the, uh, on the left and then couple families on the right. And you can see even for lone parent families, um, you know, overwhelmingly people rely upon employment income so this is all lone parent families, both those living in poverty and, and those not in poverty. But, but, but you know, th there's no question that uh, there's over $5 in employment income uh, in this province uh, for, for every $1 uh, that's received in government income transfers. And that's income transfers of, of every kind, uh, uh, H, uh, income support, uh, um, you know, any kind of federal uh, income transfers that these f families may be eligible for, child tax benefits, uh, a GST, and so on. So again, you know, uh, among lone parent families and among uh, Alberta families generally, uh, you know, people are working and still living in poverty. Um, this, this is a chart that compares the, the low income thresholds for different family sizes um, with, uh, uh, you know, with the, and again, this one focuses on lone parent families. Uh, uh, we also have a chart in our report that, uh, a similar chart for couple families. And w the way that to read this is that the blue bar is the low income threshold for a lone parent family. And so we have one child, uh, two children, and then three or more children. And, and what those low income uh, thresholds are for lone, parent family so you have to be if you're beyond that threshold below that threshold you're living in poverty and uh, and and then what the right one shows is the actual total income uh, of families the median income of all families living in poverty and and as you can see you know most people live well below the poverty line so uh, so this is kind of the midpoint you know half the families in poverty live above that line and half uh, live uh, below that line and and uh, as you can see like for a, a, a lone parent family with with one child the uh, can't even read my own writing anymore I believe it's around just under 29,000 is the uh, in after-tax income and after they've gotten all their transfers that's you know if you're below that you're living in poverty but the the typical family is is living well below that uh, I believe it's uh, 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 just over 16,000 in, in income. So we've, we've got a lot of ground to make up for, for families living in poverty. Now we want to talk a little bit about inequality. And I, how many of you, um, you know, heard some of the media coverage this week uh, about a, a new survey of, uh, uh, you know, that looks at income inequality in Canada? And, and what's interesting is just the spin that was put on the, on the uh, on the on the research uh, or on the uh, the numbers that were put out and and um, you know statistics Canada's headline was that Canada's top one percent of tax filers saw their share of total income fall to a six year low in 2012. Uh, and this came out on Tuesday and and so you know the news media sort of takes their cue from you know they don't really look at all the numbers they just take their cue from what statistics canada reports and so it's just cbc news uh, canada's richest see share of income fall to six year low and then my my pr uh, particular favorite is from the globe and mail canada's top one percent takes a hit it was kind of like uh, you know people who live uh, along the bridle path in toronto uh, went downtown with their begging bowls uh, 
Uh, it's kind of the image that sort of uh, came into my mind. And, and, I, and it was very interesting. It was really hard for me not to see this as sort of pleasing their political masters because when did the Harper government uh, come into power? It was uh, in, uh, in 2006, and that's the time frame they chose to emphasize. Even though the, 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 the complete data set uh, um, is from 1982, and when you're looking at inequality, a six-year uh, time frame is, is uh, a mere statistical blip. And uh, so what this looks at is, is income shares of the top 1% from 1982 through 2012, through this 30-year uh, period. And as you can see, it was relatively flat. Uh, I've got Canada, Alberta, Calgary, and Edmonton compared. You know, relatively flat in the 80s, and then it really increased uh, in, in the 1990s until the mid-2000s. And since then, as you can see, it has uh, dropped off again if you just look at it from an income share uh, uh, point of view. But as you can see in 2012, it's still a lot higher than it is uh, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, than it was in 1982 when we started out. And this does reflect, you know, growing inequality and partic particularly the most marked in, uh, in, in Calgary, in, in the metro Calgary area. But what, what I find interesting is income shares don't really tell much of a story in my view. Um, this, is, this is the real median, and again the midpoint after income growth in Canada between 1982 and 2012 over this 30 year period. And this is a very interesting data set. So essentially what you do is you can break it out for, for Canada to the top 0.01% of tax filers, which is one in 10,000 tax filers nationally. And as you can see, um, after uh, factoring out inflation, they've experienced um, you know, huge income growth. Uh, um, oh, it was around 153%. And then you kind of go down the line, you know, the top 0.1%, uh, and then the top 1%, and then the bottom 99, the bottom 90, and, and the, the bottom 50th. Interestingly enough, the bottom 50th did increase, uh, as, uh, uh, but, but again, it, but it does really demonstrate nationally that, you know, nationally as well, over this 30-year period, uh, most of the real gains after inflation uh, um, are uh, with the, the, uh, the top uh, income earners. Now bringing it home to Alberta, Alberta has a smaller population so you can't actually break out the top 0.01% but you can break out the top 0.1%, that's one in a thousand tax filers. And, and, uh, and as you can see, um, nationally they only gained uh, uh, 94.5% but in Alberta uh, they gained 120%, and, uh, and then you can also do the top 1%, and then the bottom uh, 90%, bottom 90%, sorry, bottom 99%, and then the bottom 90%, and the bottom 50%. So these are the Alberta numbers in terms of Alberta tax filers, and again, this is median after-tax income, uh, equivalent to disposable income after people have, uh, you know, gotten any income transfers and, and paid their taxes. And then I, I also have similar slides for, uh, for, for Edmonton and Calgary. Interestingly enough, uh, um, you know, it, it does seem like wealth concentrates somewhat in cities. If, if you look at Edmonton, uh, uh, our uh, top 1% one, 1%, uh, exceeded the, uh, the, the Alberta by, by a little bit um, in terms of how well they did in terms of real median income gains. People understand what that means, real? That's after you factor out inflation over that 30-year period. The way I calculated these uh, was just using the QP inflation calculator, which is a really cool um, inflation calculator, the best one that's out there. It's uh, part of the, the, the QP website. So uh, I'd put a real plug in. And, you, and what they do is they report all these in current dollars. So in order to find out what the real... Uh, income growth has been, you have to, uh, you know, factor out all the inflation over that 30-year period. And again, you can see that the further down the, the income scale you go, you know, the, the less median income gains there have been, uh, to the point where with the, the bottom 50%, it's, it's barely, there's barely been any gains at all. And again, this is the bottom 50% of tax filers, the bottom half of the population, no real income gains. Now, Calgary's a really interesting one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, 
if I can if I can explain it. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of people in Calgary with a lot of money, and and they have benefited enormously uh, over this 30-year period, uh, a 245% increase in in the real incomes of the you know the top. Um, you know the top 0.1 percent of tax filers, and and it is a fairly significant. It's a thousand people. I mean, Calgary's a big city, so it is about a thousand uh, tax filers that we're talking about, and then uh, almost a doubling for the top one percent, which is about uh, 10,000 tax filers. And after that, you know, the the bottom, even the bottom 99 percent of tax filers has had no real um, income growth in uh, in in. This is Metro Calgary, Calgary CMA. Uh, uh, includes all those rich people that live uh, on uh, just in uh, Rocky View County. Um, and then if you look at the bottom 50% of tax filers, there's actually, it's actually negative. Yeah, I actually uh, I didn't want to embarrass anybody from Calgary today, but, but the bottom 50% of tax filers in the last 30 years have actually lost 8%. Their, their income uh, has actually shrunk by 8% uh, over this 30-year time frame. So this is this is sort of the inequality, uh, and now I just want to get into um, you know some of the oh I wanted to get I want to reverse it a little bit um, the uh, uh, some of the equality and inequality drivers and and I think a lot of these are known to us I think the reasons that that trade unions and others fight so hard for public services is because public services are a great equalizer you know for all sorts of reasons and including. Some, some that are a little less obvious, uh, you know, because like, if you look at healthcare, for example, in, in our country still, if you're probably in only the people in the top 0.1%, you know, probably go to a private hospital, and then in most cases, if they have a serious illness, they would still end up having to go to the states. Whereas if you look at a country like the states, it's probably getting to be up to the top 10% of the population that might go to a superior or maybe even a greater percent of the population that goes to a superior private alternative. So it's also a way to sort of, you know, build support for, for public services. And so you could end up, uh, you know, uh, with the premier, uh, you know, laying in the, in the hospital bed uh, beside you. And there's a little bit less of that in education. We've got a little bit more to an elite model, but, but fighting for, uh, you know, for, for public services is, is really important. Uh, obviously, the the collective bargaining that, that was talked about by both of our uh, speakers, uh, uh, both yesterday evening and today, and, and it's in the important role that unions play uh, in this area. This, I mean, this is all, these are all drivers that increase, uh, um, you know, equality. And then, of course, on the other side, uh, you can read the list. I think we're very familiar with it, you know, right to work, uh, you know, privatization, uh, you know, labor force policies that keep uh, wages low, uh, such as you know differential wages for for the same work depending upon uh, you know if you're a new hire versus uh, you know someone that's been there for a while uh, you know the, the the temporary foreign workers uh, um, you know and so on. Yep, five minutes. Okay, I think uh, I might even make it. Okay, then I wanted to talk about tax policy equality drivers and and again you know. Um, these are somewhat obvious, maybe not quite as obvious uh, in terms of what what drives, um, you know, what increases equality and all uh, versus what decreases. I think we all talk, you know, know about the flat tax on personal income in Alberta of 10 percent, where uh, whereby the the wealthiest Albertans actually had a 41 percent cut tax cut when that uh, flat tax. Uh, came in already back in 2000 and why so many of us, uh, and I know Bill's going to be talking about this uh, this afternoon, have been been fighting to tr reinstate some progressivity in, in the income tax system. We've just had a good example federally uh, of a very regressive policy that was put in called income splitting, where, where you know, the, the lion's share of the benefit is going to go to the wealthiest families, uh, in, in most cases, uh, single earner families. And, uh, and, and in addition to that, uh, the part that was given to people of lower incomes, the, uh, the child care benefit, which isn't a benefit, but it, it is a, a payment to families, they're going to get that too. 
uh, you know, along with the low-income families. So uh, this was an incredible missed opportunity. Uh, you know, private pension schemes, uh, on average, not not to say they don't have a role, but but again, you know, the, the higher your income, the the better your pension tends to be, as opposed to public pension schemes, which are more progressive in terms of how they're set up. Um, certainly, capital gains, uh, you know, where we tax capital gains at most at at only half, you know, half the the. the uh, the, the, so if you have a, t a, mar a marginal tax rate of, of let's say 39 percent, your capital gains only get taxed at half that. Again, that there's very few people at the upper end who who tend to uh, derive almost all of the benefit from capital gains. Large corporation tax cuts, uh, you know, 15.5 percent to 10 percent in, in Alberta over uh, a period of several years. Uh, um, taxpayer protection pledges, uh, you know, there's, that seems to have been backed away from a little bit. It was something that was being pushed really hard by the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Essentially, this is to tie the hand of government to say that you will never introduce a tax increase. Extremely pernicious, pernicious because it, uh, it basically prevents any kind of, it, it can only go one way. You know, uh, uh, there cannot, the redistributive effects of the tax system can only go toward greater regressivity rather than progressivity. And then on the other side, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, some of the, the, the drivers that increase equality. Um, okay, I went through this one. And then this is my last slide. Uh, this is on income transfers. And, uh, and, 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 and income transfers don't tend to decrease, make inequal, equal, inequality worse per, per se, but there's some that are very ineffective, uh, um, such as non-refundable tax credits, so essentially, non-refundable means that you only get the tax credit, you know, if you pay tax, and then it's a, a deduction off your taxes. They are, even though some of them are maybe worthy in their own right, like charitable contributions, medical expense deductions. They're all based on the idea that you have to have some taxable income in, in order to take it, uh, advantage of them. And, and of course, you can also deduct your private insurance premiums as part of your medical expenses and and. And so these things tend to increase equal equality less. And, and also policies like income testing, asset testing, uh, failing to adjust for benefit levels for increases in living costs. I mean, these uh, t increase equality less uh, in terms of the redistributive effects of, of the tax system. Uh, ones that increase equality more include refundable tax credits that don't require a taxable income like you know, the child tax benefit system uh, federally. Um, even the universal child care benefit, we, even though it doesn't have anything to do with child care, you know, uh, um, and then direct uh, income transfers to, uh, to persons and, and, uh, and that can include even things like Ralph Bucks. And I'll just end, you, end with that. I remember when Ralph Bucks came in and everybody was saying this is terrible policy to just sort of give everybody in Alberta a $400 check. You don't want to know what happened to uh, inequality that, that year in 2006? I'll just show you. I'll end with this. Look at 2006. It was actually an incredibly progressive policy. I, I actually, I, I don't really oppose giving money to, to everyone, particularly if you're giving them the same lump sum. Because like for a single mom with three children, that was $1,600 that they got that year. And you know, that meant a lot to a low-income family. Uh, and uh, like to a high-income family, it was probably just pocket change or, or, or mad money. So, uh, so I do think, you know, there's a lot to be said if we want to reduce poverty uh, in, into uh, giving more money to, to people of low and, and modest income. And, uh, and it also reduces e inequality at the same time. So thanks very much. Thank you, John Cookman. You will have an opportunity to speak... Uh, with comment and ask questions to uh, John. And now we have Jordan Hamilton. So hello everybody, my name again is Jordan Hamilton. I work at the Calgary Drop and Rehab Center. I'm from Calgary, uh, but I feel like I'm home. I was actually born in Edmonton, um, lived here for several years, got back as quickly as I could. <laughs> um, still live in Edmonton. But so, uh, I do have a quite an attachment to Edmonton. Wonderful to be here. I um, admit I always struggle. Um, are you able to change it over? I struggle when people read my bio 
Kyle out because they expect some really brilliant, impactful speaker to come before you. And I'll be honest, I'm not that bright. One of the reasons I think I spent as much time in school as I possibly did is just because I needed the help. <laughs> um, it was cool. I heard that loud and clear. <laughs> and, uh, and it certainly benefited me. Um, so I do work at the Calgary Drop and Rehab Center. Calgary Drop and Rehab Center it is a homeless shelter. And as was read, it is, in fact, uh, Canada's largest homeless shelter. Um, not something I'm especially proud of, to be honest. I wish that wasn't the case. Shocking, in fact, is how many people come to us every single month looking for help. Uh, every single month, and we see this consistently, um, we'll see over 7,000 different people walking through our doors looking for help. I'll say that again. We'll see over 7,000 different people coming to our shelter every single month. Um, I'm an economist. I hate seeing numbers like that. On a busy day, and it's, it's snowing here. I don't know if it's snowing in Calgary, but on a busy day, and when it snows, we'll, we'll see how those busy days. We'll have upwards of 1,800 different people walk through our shelter doors. Everyone of them's looking for help. So I'm often asked the question, why are so many people coming to us? Can you go to the slide, please? So I'm often asked the question, just why are so many people come to us looking for help? Um, 7,000 on, on a month. And I'll be honest, I, hard to get the answer, opening a textbook. Hard to get the answer um, through, through expert opinion. Um, so I don't often try to. Instead, I actually I, I go to the source. And I did that recently. Can you go to the next slide? Yes, thank you. And I did that recently by speaking to a guy by the name of Dusty. So in preparation for this, we asked Dusty, like, why are you homeless, Dusty? Like, we've seen some people in Calgary doing really, really well. Um, Dusty isn't. He's been living in our shelter since 2007. The man's been struggling for some time. Hasn't always lived in our shelter, but he comes in and out. He, uh, he's an amazing guy. He, he volunteers with us almost every single day. Um, works when he can work, isn't always able to find work. And in Dusty's case, he uh, isn't always able to find work. He, um, he's, he's, he's aging. He's 60 years old now. Um, he's not a young man, as you can see in the picture. And his body just isn't physically capable of putting in those five days a week, 40 hours a week. Um, he's, he's not sick enough to qualify for age, uh, but he's sick enough that he can't work as often as he's required to in order to afford rent. So considering that, um, I still asked him the question, Dusty, like, why do you live in our shelter? And he took me for a really interesting tour, walking around to Calgary, showing me that, in fact, he, he did at one point in time have a house. And he showed me some of the places he used to live. Can you go to the next slide, please? This is actually one of the places Dusty used to live. Interesting space. This is called the Shamrock Motor Inn. Um, it's, in fact, still open. Great place. Um, it's a place Dusty used to live. He, he lived there for years and years and years, off and on. Um, while he lived there, he paid uh, $30 a night. That's not bad. Dusty could afford $30 a night. Things have changed. A few years ago, the Shamrock actually had a, a major fire. Um, for that period of time, Dusty lost his home. But when they renovated, once they replaced everything that was lost in that fire, um, they also increased the rental rates for those rooms. Now they're charging $100 a night, which Dusty can't always afford. I mean, if you do the math, that's $3,000 a month. I can't afford $3,000 a month. Dusty says he can afford between four and $600 a month in rent. So Dusty no longer lives there anymore, despite the fact that it continues to operate. Can you go to the next slide? This is another place Dusty showed me, another place he used to live. Um, Nice looking building. I, uh, I love the historic features. It's gorgeous. I'm sure Dusty was very happy there. Can't live there anymore. It's now boarded up. Fully functioning building. I mean, they could change the curtains, open the doors, um, but that's what's happening, as you can see. It's boarded up. Dusty no, no longer can live. So I asked him where else he could possibly live, where else he has lived before. He showed me. He used to live here. It's now closed. This is called the uh, King Edward Hotel. Um, there's some pretty ambitious plans for this building. They're actually turning this building into the National Music Center. That's great. If you can afford the ticket to get in, Dusty can't. Used to be Dusty's home. Let's go to the next slide. This is another place Dusty used to live. Really enjoyed living there. As you can see, beautiful, beautiful facility. Um, the National Hotel, I, I'd love to live there. I can't live there, nor can Dusty. Can you go to the next slide? This is the Calgarian Hotel. Um, he doesn't live there anymore either. He can't. That's not an option in his life. It's now a parking lot. And we, we tore that building down. Dusty's home. 
so we can park some cars. Calgary has some of the most expensive parking rates in, in, in North America. Um, I'm glad people have a place to park. But it was Dusty's home. Let's go to the next slide. This is another place Dusty used to live. This was actually called the Auberge Hotel, a hostel, sorry. Um, we tore it down to build a $1.4 billion building. Um, I'm glad that they have office space. That's important, right? Came at the expense of Dusty. Yeah, I used to love living there. It's just off Center Street. Wonderful, convenient location next to all kinds of uh, employment opportunities. Um, we built a $1.4 billion office tower there, the Bow Building, at the expense of Dusty's home. Can you go to the next slide, please? This is the St. Regis. This building was also bought by the same uh, um, office tower development, the Bow. Dusty loved living there, but he can't anymore. The structure wasn't torn down. It still exists today. Um, they could change the curtains. They could change the, uh, the carpeting, move them into more if they wanted to. But that's not the plan. The doors are closed. Next slide, please. This is another place Dusty used to live. Um, it was called a single room occupancy. Uh, a great place. It was a, quite, a, quite a big building. Um, and in this building, under this SRO model, what Dusty had is he had his own room, had his own washroom, um, which was great for him. It's, it was very desirable in his case. And uh, he'd come down to a common kitchen to eat and enjoy the company of others. Now it's a parking lot. It uh, gives you a nice view of our shelter, though. That's our shelter in the background. I'd rather see Dusty's home. Next slide, please. It's another SRO, single room occupancy, essentially a hotel that Dusty used to live in. Um, looks like at one point in time it was a great building, historic building. I love the brick. I'm sure Dusty did, too. But he can't live there anymore. It's not boarded up. Next slide, please. This is another place Dusty used to live. <laughs> Excuse me if I'm boring you. This goes on and on and on. <laughs> um, this is another place Dusty used to live. This is another rooming house. Dusty really enjoyed working there. Said it was run by a wonderful old lady. Um, said she was very kind, very compassionate. It's no longer her home anymore, nor is it Dusty's home. There's a big proud sign in the background, though, saying uh, Stampede Expansion and Development. Isn't that great? Because um, it's wonderful to have a party for 10 days of the year. Attracts a lot of people. They bring in a lot of money. Um, I love a good party. I love the free pancakes. I also loved when Dusty had a home there. Now it's a parking lot. And so is the next one. This is also next to the Stampede. Um, there was an apartment building there. Dusty lived there, as did other people. Now we're parking cars there. Next slide, please. This is another place we used to, Dusty used to live. This was also an apartment building. So this isn't the original structure when Dusty lived there. They, in fact, tore that building down. And it was replaced, in fact, with, uh, you can see the sign, a casino. That's great. <laughs> if you've got money to spend in a casino, Dusty doesn't have a lot of money to spend in a casino. He's not even a gambler. Um, but yeah, good for you and I, right? Too bad for Dusty. Let's go to the next slide. Another building, demolished. Let's go to the next slide. Dusty actually, uh, for a point in time, used to work for the Stampede. And just because the Stampede was busy tearing down people's homes, they at one point in time, logically, thought they had to provide housing. So they gave Dusty uh, a trailer at the very back. Dusty's actually pointing to it using a pen. Um, Said it was great. It was within walking distance of work. He enjoyed that. Um, it was very convenient for him. But those trailers have since been uh, removed. Dusty can't live in that trailer anymore. Next slide. This is another place Dusty used to live. This is a Cecil Hotel. Dusty hated living there. <laughs> it wasn't a very pleasant place to live. <laughs> Dusty said that uh, it was always his last resort. If he couldn't get into the Regis, if he couldn't get into the National, if he couldn't get into the Shamrock, um, the Cecil was always an option for him. And uh, despite the fact that it wasn't a great place to live, he used to live there. It was his home on, on occasion. And he does have some fond memories working or living there. Um, he was actually there when the building actually closed. So he was staying there, and uh, he remembers being in the bar. He told me very proudly that he bought the last pint of beer in the, in the building before they closed it. He was actually in the bar at 10 o'clock in the morning when the police came in, um, removed the liquor license off the wall, told everyone to get out. Dusty, with his pint in his hand, says, I paid for this. I'm finishing it. <laughs> He's a man of principle, <laughs> um, wants value for his money. And uh, they politely let him finish his beer um, while they walked around the building, taking pictures of it, just capturing this moment in time. It was a big day when we closed the Cecil Hotel. People were very proud of it. Dusty, though, had a very different perception of that experience. I'm glad he got his last drink. Can you go to the next slide? So I appreciate it. I threw a lot of slides at you, um, but I think it tells a really interesting story. The story it tells is just is what's actually happening in Calgary. Since the 1970s, Calgary's really, really gentrified. Um, 
we're not building a city for people like Dustin anymore. We're building a city for other people. Um, some of the profiteers we're talking about during this, during this uh, conference. Um, it's amazing just how many different hotels, motels, SROs, low-income apartment buildings have actually been lost. Something we actually did is we took a look at uh, an old Yellow Pages book from the 1970s. Um, very scientific. <laughs> Sorry for that. As I told you, I'm not very bright. Um, but we found this old phone book from the 1970s on microfiche. We opened it up. We took a look at all the different SROs, the different hotels. And uh, we found that uh, at that point in time, there was more than 56 of these around town, mostly concentrated downtown. Those 56 have been demolished. Um, room and houses have been lost. In fact, entire, ha entire blocks of neighborhoods um, have been lost, demolished, in the name of progress. Um, some cases, we've, we've destroyed this housing to, to build casinos. Isn't that a shame? Can you go to the next slide? So this is a, a slide of downtown Calgary in the 1970s. Um, sorry, I'm not very tech savvy. <laughs> it's not the clearest symbol. Um, I appreciate you can't read any of the text, but uh, I color-coded it, though. So the, uh, the green um, are all those SROs, those hotels that Dusty used to live at, um, and others as well. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. This is just downtown. On the periphery, you can see even more. And we didn't look at the whole city. If I looked at the whole city, I would have shown you a lot more blocks of buildings that used to be in Dusty's case. Home. Um, hard to tell, uh, but uh, there's actually two blocks, inner city as well, on the top right-hand side. Um, in kind of a teal color. Sorry, I like teal. I appreciate the conflicts with the green, but I like teal. It's trendy. Um, so I get a teal. And those two teal blocks, they're, uh, they're shelters. So in the 1970s, we had two large shelters in town. Um, what we did have was a lot more housing. Can you go to the next slide? We lost all those low-income motels. We lost all that housing. And that's what we see here. What we see instead among the teal blocks are shelters. We lost the SROs, we built shelters. Single room occupancy, those hotels that we talked about. Yeah, so there are still some, uh, some of these um, hotels around. Um, the Shamrock being one, I kept that there, despite the fact that Dusty can't afford to live there. Because um, I'll be honest, Dusty still does on occasion live there. Um, we can only live there for three, four nights of the, of the month. That's it. Otherwise, he's living with us in one of the 10 blocks of shelters. He's staying at ours. Can you go to the next slide? So flashback to the present day. Um, I'll admit some progress has been made, and I certainly appreciate that as well. We do have a 10-year plan in homelessness. Um, I think that's wonderful. I uh, applaud their work. And since 2008, um, the government has actually dedicated some money to the, to the construction of affordable housing. Um, quite a generous sum, in fact, $350 million into affordable housing. That's great. I think we need to appreciate that. Um, that deserves to be celebrated. The problem, however, is that uh, the government awarded this, fun this, this funding. Um, what they didn't give the nonprofits who are supposed to access this money is the influence to open up these affordable housing buildings. So we've got the financial means. We don't have the influence. Mm. Um, and what's interesting is we're building a lot of the wrong housing. Um, I don't think people, enough people ask people like Dusty, where did you lose to live? Where do you want to live? So the housing we're actually building is places you and I might like to live, uh, not dusty. We're building a lot of one-bedroom apartments. Um, and that's great. If you don't mind living alone, um, isolated, it was never a model Dusty liked to live in. In Dusty's case, he liked to have his own private room to sleep. He, he liked that privacy. It gave him great comfort. Um, liked having his own washroom. That was nice as well. But he didn't like to live alone. He liked to go down to the restaurant downstairs, eat among others. When I think about my home and why I love my home, it isn't because I've got this really great couch that I like to sit on by myself, or I've got this great big screen TV, or a lot of books. Um, that's not why I go home into the day. I go home into the day because there's people there that love me. I'm happily married, I have a beautiful kid. Um, they're the reason why I love my home. It's because it's filled with people I love. Can you go to the next slide, please? So some people have actually asked that question, where do you want to live? Um, it's amazing what they find. They find that people actually want to live in these uh, SRO units, these hotels. Um, units with a private washroom without a kitchenette. This study was actually done in 2002 by the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. I understand they're pretty, uh, pretty credible as an agency. Um, most people trust their work. Not enough people are listening. Something they actually they, they quoted that study 
um, sorry, sorry, something they actually said in the conclusion of that study is that rooming houses and SROs are actually the least expensive form of permanent housing and are essential. They're essential for very low income single men and women. So Canada, Mor or Calgary Mor Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation, national company, um, they do great work. Um, they released a study. Nobody's listening to them. Not enough people are listening to Dusty because it's perhaps not what we want. But that's all we're building is what we, what we want. As we're gentrifying, um, we're not giving the people what the people actually wants. Can you go to the next slide, please? So I'll be honest, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I hope that people are paying attention to people like Dusty. I hope that people pay attention to really credible agencies like the Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation. They've got some pretty smart people. Um, Dusty's a really bright guy. People are trying, I'll, I'll admit that. Um, the Calgary Drop and Rehab Center, the organization I work for, we, uh, we heard Dusty's message loud and clear. Um, we actually bought a uh, SRO building. Um, we bought a hotel. It used to be a quality inn. It wasn't a very quality hotel. <laughs> um, when we bought the building, we actually had uh, nine hookers living in the building, um, working girls. Yeah. Um, when we bought the building, the building was actually $20 million in receivership. Uh, we bought it under bankruptcy. Very excited to buy this quality inn. And uh, we very ambitiously told the community, we're, we're, we're pleased to open this building up very, very quickly. We had aggressive plans. Um, we essentially just had to change the drapes, change the carpeting, and uh, people were ready to move in. Um, we were ready to move people in. We retained the cleaning staff as well. Uh, they actually still continue to work for us. But the building, however, has sat vacant for the last two and a half years. It's tied up in city bureaucracy. Our mayor, um, heralded by some circles, he actually stood up in front of a community gathering talking about our property, saying sometimes red tape is a good thing. Not always, though. It's meant that Dusty's lived in our shelter for the last two and a half years when he could have been in housing. I think that's a shame. Um, the city of Vancouver has a very different mayor as well. Um, wonderful man. Uh, deserves a lot of the praise he gets. And they understand that this housing model is important. So recently they bought a quality in. It was actually a quality in as well. Um, they just bought it about a few months ago. And uh, the city bought it, um, knowing that nonprofits don't have the same kind of influence that city government has. Um, within one week, that hotel was open, receiving people. Within one week, it was housing. We've had our building for over two years. And for those two years, it sat vacant. Not because we're not trying. But because, while we might have been given the finances to procure it, we didn't give the res given the influence to get our development permit through the city. So it's sitting empty. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, but I really, really do hope that people come together to open housing. That's not just good for you and I, but good for the people who are actually going to move into it. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Jordan Hamilton. Okay, just to reiterate, and I think that what we may want to do, since we only have one active mic, is uh, uh, John and Jordan, if you want to come up front here, we can just uh, just cozy up like a, like a trio. And uh, just to reiterate, uh, and John, are you going to be able to, can anyone actually access, here, come around. Can anyone actually access the, um, the slide? Uh, or are they going to be part of the Edmonton Social Planning Council website? Um, so, uh, I'm certainly happy. I don't know what, what the plan is at, at the council. I mean, uh, does Parkland make them available? Because I'm certainly happy to make yes. them available. I think they will. So they will be part of the conference proceedings. That's probably, if somebody wants the slides ahead of then, uh, just come see me and I can just uh, email them to you as well. Just ask, because there's a lot of uh, important uh, information. Are you getting a, a level on this? Okay. Um, just to reiterate, uh, poverty in Alberta uh, has increased over 16%. Uh, over One in six kids uh, living in poverty. Um, the uh, inequality has skyrocketed since 1982. Uh, seeing some of those uh, graphs were absolutely shocking. Um, and it's interesting to see the difference in Calgary to Edmonton. Uh, I used to live in Lethbridge twice, so uh, seeing that at 19% was absolutely no surprise. 
Uh, Jordan Hamilton, um, 7,000 people come to the shelter every month. Is that what you said? That is shameful and absolutely uh, staggering, staggering. Um, just to open it up now to you, comments and questions, I'm wondering if, uh, if you, ha oh, do you have an active mic? Excellent. So just see this lovely uh, young volunteer here. A uh, show of hands, whoever wants to comment. And if the speakers could reiterate the question, all right. There's a question over here from Mr. Belmore Kilgannon. Thank you. Uh, both John or Jordan, you can perhaps answer this question. When they brought in the 10-year plan to eliminate homelessness, they took a lot of the money out of the HEP fund. And so we are helping people when they're homeless, but not so much when they're about to become homeless. So I think it's worthy to talk about that and to understand how they shifted that money and where a lot of those funds came from. Um, well, that's true. There was definitely, is this working? Um, there definitely was a sort of a robbing Peter to pay Paul aspect to the 10-year plan uh, to end homelessness uh, because the, 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 the HEP fund was one thing, uh, it, it, you know, we, we, it was poorly run, uh, it was unfortunate, uh, but, but there is a rent supplement program and, and funding has either been reduced for that uh, or frozen for the last five years uh, at a time when, when our vacancy rates have been going down and our rents have been skyrocketing. Uh, I mean, this is a, an issue throughout Alberta, so uh, we need more money for rental assistance, uh, particularly for some of those folks, uh, you know, who are, you know, a little closer to the, to the poverty line and they just need some help paying the rent. And uh, we also have been underinvesting in and certainly Jordan spoke very powerfully to that, uh, you know, we just haven't made the investment required into all types of, uh, um, you know, affordable housing, uh, everything from the nearer market housing, the independent living housing, to the more uh, supportive housing model, uh, single room occupancy. Uh, just speaking to that briefly, uh, the YMCA in Edmonton is actually, uh, their downtown facility is a good example of a an SORI type uh, type facility, and and there is, you know, the, the YMCA is sort of struggling to keep that open, uh, just because of the age of the facility, and that would be an incredible loss, uh, you know, to uh, to folks, uh, you know, who otherwise might have no alternative but a shelter. So yeah, we need to invest more in housing. Yeah, thank you. Well said. Um, something I can share is that the government's trying to correct some of the mistakes it's made. One of the things it's beginning to appreciate is that people don't want to live alone. Um, I certainly don't want to live alone. I don't do well living alone. Um, uh, far better living with my wife, people around me that love me. Um, so they've since invested in a program within our building called the Housing with Intensive Supports. It was interesting just uh, developing that program. Um, the money came from the province to the Homeless Foundation, channeled through to us as the implementing agent. Um, they, we saw this proposal come out. Uh, how do we keep people in their homes? And um, we actually we took it seriously, but at the same time, we put together the most expensive proposal we could possibly put together. <laughs> we said that people need public health nurses. We, uh, we shared that people need not just to have a caseworker come in once a week, open the refrigerator door, uh, make sure there's still food in the fridge, said goodbye, and that they'll see the person in a week's time. Um, we needed far more involved support. We needed community. Um, so we put together the most expensive proposal, and um, I'm glad that it was accepted by the Homeless Foundation. They understood the logic behind it. So we're doing it, but of course, it's, it's not the best approach. I mean, that's expensive. Um, I'd much rather just build communities within buildings than bringing so-called experts into the space to fix people's problems. They have the solutions themselves. They want, they want to come together themselves. Um, we need to build appropriate housing. Yeah, I um, I have uh, a qu one question for each of you, if it's if it doesn't take too much time. Um, uh, Jordan, am I right in 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 saying that the difference between Calgary and Vancouver is that in Calgary they let the developers have their way, and then said, "Oh, but we're budgeting 300 million," whereas in Vancouver they took the homelessness the homeless into account. Um, really from the time they started uh, developing the, the Expo lands and the Woodward building and everything. That, that in other words, they planned for uh, a certain amount of low-income housing from the start. And that, that's really the difference. 
Calgary really does get, or sorry, Vancouver really does get the SRO model. Um, they've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in SROs. Um, yeah. It's making a difference. And uh, they're not just leaving it up to the nonprofits to do it. Um, I appreciate there's this wonderful transference of responsibility to the, pro to the nonprofits, which sounds great in theory. It's nice to have local decision making, but they're only transferring some finances, some responsibility, not necessarily the influence. Um, whereas Vancouver, the city is still buying these properties, um, which is, makes a huge difference. When we, when we can buy it, we're, we're trapped within bureaucratic models where we can, in fact, open it up. It's difficult. It yeah. um, doesn't need to be. Um, could I also ask John, I mean, I saw in, in the Edmonton Sun yesterday, uh, Lauren Gunter was saying it would be dangerous to move away from a flat tax. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and he said, and he, <laughs> and he said, qu and he quoted Jack Mintz, who else, um, as saying that it would actually, uh, that it wouldn't even raise revenue. And I'm just wondering where, you know, where is the flaw in that? I mean, are, I mean, Jack Mintz wouldn't lie, but is Jack, is he quoting him out of context? What, where, where could, if we were going to write a letter to the Edmonton Sun, what, how would you pinpoint the flaw in that editorial? Well, actually, I, I think uh, I. Probably where I would start is just uh, how much lower um, taxes are in Alberta than, than everywhere else. And, and, and the uh, flat tax on personal income is, is just part of that. If we were taxed at the, the same rate, tax rates, ac across the board uh, as the next lowest tax province, uh, our government would raise $11.6 billion dollars. In, in more money. The, all of the, the, the Alberta Could website is an excellent resource in that respect that, uh, that Bill and others were, were uh, involved with. $11.6 billion to the next lowest tax province, which happens to be British Columbia. So where are these people going to go? You know, that would be my question. I mean, I mean the next, uh, I'm trying to remember what the, the next lowest uh, marginal tax rate is, but it's, it's, I think it's 14 to 15 percent, somewhere in that range. So they're certainly not going to go to any other province. Contrary to public perception, the U.S. actually taxes, uh, has higher marginal uh, tax rates, a more progressive income tax system than, than Canada does. So, so where are they going to go? Somewhere in the U.S. Uh, they're going to get hit with higher taxes. So it's, uh, it's based on this notion that these rich people can live wherever they want. Well, we can easily raise you know, the, the top tax rate, tax rate to 14 or 15 percent, and, and they're still going to be better off in, in Alberta than, uh, than in other, and than anywhere else in, in North America, really uh, the world. So, uh, and then they still don't have to pay the sales tax. They still have the lowest fuel taxes uh, in the country, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I want to give a uh, bit of uh, experience from Grand Prairie. Um, I am an AISH recipient, and uh, I just want to share with you, um, AISH allows $1,588 a month, but they deduct any employment income and any CPP disability payments. So I actually get, uh, from uh, the Alberta government itself, I get $940 a month. My rent for a 300 square foot bachelor apartment uh, for, through Boardwalk Equities is uh, $764 a month. Includes water only. My power is extra. My uh, uh, communications is extra. Um, and uh, it's an old building, so uh, it does take a little bit to heat. Um, my neighbor is, uh, got a, a rental subsidy and is not going to be able to move because it is grandfathered. Uh, so he's stuck living where he is because if he was to move, he would lose his rental subsidy. You know, um, we also have a building that uh, was the Grand Prairie uh, Care Center um, that only had two elevators uh, and wasn't effective for, for senior residents because... Uh, they couldn't transport people in wheelchairs to the dining room and back uh, in, in the efficient. It took two hours to transport them down for lunch and two hours to transport them back. Uh, so by then, they had to start transporting for the next meal. They shut that down. They were going to convert that into a, uh, a, a second stage housing for, uh, from a, a, a homeless shelter. 
but when they uh, transferred it over, the landlord took the generator out. And uh, so then they left it operational for a little bit and uh, until the city said, you know, if you can't replace that generator, we can't keep having this operating. So people are back on the streets and the uh, our, our rotary house shelter is full to the max and people are having camp uh, uh, a tent to camp down in the park again. Uh, within our shelter, it's interesting. Um, if we can get our clients on AISH, we can get them into housing. Um, getting on AISH is like winning the lottery for our clients. Um, but something we see is that, of course, uh, AISH rates, of course, are woefully inadequate. Um, we actually have two AISH recipients. Um, they're a couple living together in one of our affordable housing buildings. Um, we, we do give them a subsidized rental rate. And uh, uh, despite that, they still come to our shelter every single week to do their laundry. Um, because in our building, it's $5 a, a week to do laundry. Um, that $5 a week adds up to $20 a month, which for them is actually a nice lunch out once a month, which is something they really appreciate. Um, Two-thirds of the people coming to us come to us living in poverty. They don't come to us looking for shelter. They come to us because they struggle to afford groceries. They come to us because they're struggling to afford even, even a haircut. Um, we offer free haircuts in our building. Um, people want to do their laundry for free. We let them do their laundry for free. Um, there's a lot of people who are in their homes who are struggling. That's a tragedy. I, I'm sorry for that. Just wanted to Sadie brought up a really important point, and and that is that and Guy Standing mentioned it last night too. Like we often think of the people that Lord and Gunther seems to be uh, very concerned about as uh, having the highest uh, tax rates, uh, it, but that is not the case. Low income people, you know, uh, have the, the highest top marginal tax rates in the country, and it's for the reason that Sadie mentioned that. You work, you try to work harder, you try to make more money through employment, and you're penalized for doing so. And it's not only the loss of, like, of, a, of an AISH, uh, um, uh, you know, the clawbacks of, of AISH or social assistance, and the social assistance clawbacks are even more punitive than the AISH clawbacks. But nonetheless, it, when you add to that, you, you can lose childcare subsidy, uh, you can use uh, the national child benefit, uh, you can use, in some cases, your rent goes up uh, if you're in a rent geared to income uh, situation. So, so as he talked about, uh, it's very true in Canada as well that it can be, you can, for every dollar more you make from employment, you can use up to a dollar in, in these kinds of benefits. And we've got to stop punishing low-income people for working harder and try to, trying to better themselves. And, and, and uh, so I agree very much with your point on that. That's something that we've certainly been, been pushing quite strongly. Stop pe penalizing people from, you know, who are trying to, to better themselves. Uh, uh, and, and yeah, anyway. Hi there. Um, I just uh, curious. In, you know, it's one thing to build a shelter. It's one thing to give them four walls and a cot. I'm just wondering, do you see some uh, investment as well into the n the tools necessary to maintain that residence? Do you see that either from the municipalities or from the provincial or federal government? Do you see any support as well in that aspect? Great question. Thanks for asking it. Um, so not our shelters are created equal. Um, some shelters, for example, they take the money given to them by the province and they don't fundraise. So we have a shelter in Calgary that doesn't fundraise. Uh, they take money given to them. And it's amazing what they can do with that. So as an example, um, that shelter, just like us, gets $1.20 per day for food per person. Um, that's $1.20 per day. And from that figure, they're supposed to provide breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Let's give it a try. Um, I don't know about you, but actually I pay more for my morning coffee than a buck twenty. The shelter does try. So what they do is instead they, uh, they give everybody um, two sandwiches as part of a bag lunch, and they give them a cup of ramen noodle. That's their breakfast. They're supposed to subside off that for lunch as well, and that's also what they're supposed to enjoy for dinner. Um, I think that's awful. So in our building, we do, we do actually fundraise. Um, we actually fundraise 50 cents on the dollar. We get 45% uh, of our budget from the province, 2% from the city, 2% from the United Way, then fundraise the remaining 50%. Um, it's amazing what you can do when you, when you ask for help. Um, we, we do that. By asking for help, it means we can do a lot more. So not only are we just providing a cot, we're, we're providing a different range of housing options. Um, something I'm really proud of is we do provide uh, um, skill building, employment skills training. It's incredible. So other people have asked us, including the province, why don't they just go next door to Bull Valley? We have a beautiful college next to us. Um, problem with going to Bull Valley, of course, is it has tuition costs. 
So we train people inside our building. We have to fundraise for that. We don't get any money from the province. Um, through that program, we give people up to 17 different industry certifications. Things like H2O is alive, confined space awareness, transportation dangerous goods, um, WMIS for stay, or for forklift. Um, great, great things that actually give people an earning potential of between $45,000 and $60,000 a year in this province. Um, that's awesome. Province doesn't fund it. We've got to ask others to, to contribute to that program. Um, the government does need to stand up. Step up. Sorry. Hi. So um, you've spoken a bit about the um, the experience in Vancouver of them being able to retain some of the SROs and things like that. Now, sort of historically, we know that that's actually been a bit of a fight in Vancouver, right, to keep those things going. That's taken a broader push from the community. Um, we've seen loss of some of that housing here, but I'm wondering, are there strategies that we should be undertaking as people who are active and engaged in our communities? Are there policies and things that we should be pushing for to ensure that we can start to see some of those same things in place here from our municipal governments so that all the responsibility for this isn't pushed off onto our nonprofit sector? Yeah, thank you. We, um, it's going to take a little bit of pressure on our government. We, uh, when we bought this building, when there was so much public backlash, just fear on, on what the model was going to look like. Um, people were concerned we're going to open up the Cecil again. I don't know if you've heard of the Cecil, but it didn't exactly have a great reputation. We're not going to run it like the Cecil. We're not going to have a bar on the first floor. We're not going to invite a bunch of prostitutes to live in the building. Um, we will run it ourselves with 24-hour supervision support. It'll be just a, an incredible asset in the community. Um, until we open it, however, that fear is going to remain. Um, so when, uh, when part of the public backlash was happening, we invited this chief uh, urban planner for the city, an amazing man. His name's Roland Stanley. Um, new into the role, he's, he's, he's quite famous across Canada. Um, he's got some good ideas. And in, in inviting him to our building, to our main shelter, we said, we don't want to talk about this, this single building. Um, we know you're a bigger picture thinker. Instead, please tell us where we can build, where we can open housing. Um, unless we know, um, unless there's a plan in place, we're going to continue facing public backlash. Um, so one, give us a plan. I mean, at, at a minimum, we're, we're, pleased to, we're pleased to operate these spaces, but what's the plan? Um, we, of course, we also have to come together. Um, there's a small vocal minority in the community where we bought this building. They've been sending around a petition. Um, they weren't able to attract enough signatures in the immediate neighborhood, so they, they went broader into different communities, surrounding communities, and I don't know how many signatures they have now, but yeah, I mean, I, I'd love when we go to the, um, the, uh, the appeal board, because um, we know that people will appeal this, even if it's just one person. It still will go before the appeal board, um, which drags out uh, our ability to open it up. Um, I'd love to be able to show um, thousands and thousands and thousands of signatures of people who support this. Um, so we've got a website. We're very fancy as an organization. We've got a website. And uh, one of the banners on our website is actually a picture of this hotel model we, we bought. Uh, encouraging people just to come together and sign a petition. Um, it's not much. I mean, we're just mobilizing people. We're not necessarily organizing. Uh, but we've got a voice, and if none of us come together, it'll show people in power that this is an important housing model, that it's vital. Dusty signed it. Hi, I'm, my name is Roxanne. I live in that neighborhood. I, I was one of the people that they came around to, you know, it's not that neighborhood. It is a, a neighborhood that adjoins to that site. And I, I checked the development permit and th there is approval, but it seems that they've changed it from SRO to that the people actually have to have a uh, wage to be living in the building. So, I mean, that's a big hurdle because most people don't have, have an income, right? A lot of people that use SROs don't have an income, so it's not going to be utilized, I think, the way that you guys intended that it was going to be utilized. But I think that one of the bigger problems that we have is the demonization of poor people, people in poverty, and how people have this fear of people that are impoverished. And I think somehow we have to find a way to, I don't know, speak to people so they don't have that fear. Because... You know, it's very difficult when you go past the homeless shelter and you see people that are really in low places in their lives and you walk through there and it is somewhat scary, okay? And for people that don't understand, 
they are afraid. So when you put, want to put something in a community where they're go they think they're going to have that type of people in their community, it's going to cause problems in their community. How do you speak to people to, you can undemonize the poor people, to get, the, get their voice out there so people can see it. And this is a great presentation so that it makes it personal. That's one person's journey through life and poverty, but there's so many more, right? Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate your honesty. Thank you. It's, it's hard to share a perspective like that um, after seeing Dusty's face, so thank you for sharing. Um, something I want to share is that uh, uh, we actually, when we bought the building, the plan was SRL model. Um, we put that before the community, and because we are trying to work with the community to, to, to open the building. I mean, we want to provide housing. That's our, our mission, our mandate. And uh, um, so because the community didn't appreciate the first model, we came back with a second, then we came back with a third. Um, the last model included uh, one bedrooms um, and a very small portion of which was SRO models, which truly helps our clients. Um, we were actually willing to compromise our programmatic ideals um, to piece a community. Unfortunately, the community kept rejecting it. Didn't matter what we proposed, it was rejected. Um, but to answer your question that uh, people can't afford to live there, 50% of our clients actually work. 50% of our clients work. Um, Dusty actually lives on a, on a floor within our shelter where he can't drink. He can't have a single pint of beer. Um, um, he's on that floor, uh, with, uh, on that floor there's 140 people, on the floor above him there's 120, same model, can't drink, can't have a, kind of a single glass of alcohol. And personally I like to have a glass of wine on occasion, doesn't happen often, um, but I can't stay on those sleeping floors. So Dusty is somebody, can't have a single drink, I'm sleeping next to on those two floors, 260 people. Um, who Alcohol isn't a factor in their lives. Um, most of these people are actually seniors, people on income supports. Um, OIS, CPP, all those different income supports. They want to pay rent. Um, they don't want to live in a shelter. Uh, we're not going to move anybody into this hotel who can't afford to pay rent. Otherwise, how would we pay the bills? <laughs> um, the province isn't going to give us any money for operational funding. It has to be self-sustaining. So everybody staying there would pay rent. It'd be, it'd be housing. Well, maybe I'll just uh, follow up on, on the last question. Uh, I'm, uh, first of all, I mean, I work on housing issues as well uh, for my organization, and uh, I'm not sure single room occupancy is, is language that, um, you know, it, it has some bad connotations in this city. Even in Vancouver, you know, I've been reading articles uh, where they did put a lot of money into SROs, and uh, a lot of these, you know, private sector runs ones are once again in need of repairs after only a few years. Uh, having said that, I know it can really work. Uh, like I think the YMCA, uh, it, but it really needs management. And I think part of it is the, uh, you know, sh the, the, the positive examples of where, of where it has worked. Uh, um, and, and it is the type of housing we need the most of is the, you know, we tend to use the word permanent housing with uh, on-site supports, um, you know, a, a language, and it can work really well. And, and, is the, and is the type of housing that is in, in most uh, desperate need because, you know, as... Uh, uh, Jordan pointed out, uh, you know, those are the folks that are just the hardest, you know, in terms of community acceptance. I mean, a good example of that was the Terwilliger Town fiasco here in Edmonton uh, last summer. It was a permanent supportive housing uh, project. I mean, sometimes communities will take, you know, it's called affordable housing, but it simply may be 90% of average market rents. And for, for the people who really are most in desperate need, they, they can't afford that. They need some sort of rent geared to income uh, housing, and, and in some cases they do need housing with on-site supports where you can maybe share to reduce the cost, you can, and, and to create a bit of a sense of community, you can do some bathroom sharing and kitchen uh, sharing and, uh, or even a dining room or some such uh, concept, and it can really w work well, but, but management I is definitely the key, because we've seen some disasters and that's what often, you know, creates mistrust in the community. So anyway, and that's, that's our, part of the reason why I personally feel, you know, uh, I would limit private sector involvement. I think it's okay to have them involved more in the, the near market housing, but, but most of the disasters we've had in this city has been with private people, you know, trying to run very high needs housing. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to thank Jordan Hamilton and John Kochman for speaking on the fault lines of poverty.